Welcome to Mornings with Mike. Public Safety Today. Grab a coffee and sign up to receive your call-in information. Be a part of the show. For more information at any time, please visit www.tapsd.org. Now, let's get started with your host, Mike Pazesny. Then we have wilderness camps and ranches. Wilderness camps or, or ranches became popular in the 60s and the 70s. It kind of grew out of the feminist movement looking for alternative ways to be able to get things done. And these camps focus not on the crime that the youth committed, but on the self-efficacy of the youth by exposing them to different kinds of challenging situations. Um, they may complete a ropes course. For those of us, I, I've taken a ropes course before. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, they might complete a ropes course. They might go on a hiking expedition. They may have to camp outdoors for a long period of time. They may learn survival skills, you know, on how to build a fire and find shelter and cook their own food. Stuff will be good for them when they're back out on the street, you know. So challenging these delinquents to overcome certain physical challenges is thought to increase their belief in themselves their ability to reach their own goals, um, their their mindset when it comes to taking themselves more seriously uh, and their potential success in the world. And this is the foundation of what we call the experiential learning approach, the act of learning through doing, through experience, engaging in physical activities to learn a concept rather than passive strategies like reading a book or telling them to, you know, uh, write a letter of apology to the victim or something like that. We're going to immerse them in uh, the survival culture. Um, the duration of these kinds of camps varies. Uh, sometimes it's several weeks. Sometimes it's months long. There's a highly structured wilderness camp in Florida called the Florida Environmental Institute. And uh, the um, FEI targets youth adjudicated of felony charges by the Department of Juvenile Justice here in Florida. And it's nicknamed the Last Chance Ranch. Uh, it, it's in a remote area of the Florida Everglades where all the non-native pythons now exist, which <laughs> which which makes escape almost impossible. So uh, participants typically stay at the ranch for about a year and during that time assist with raising pigs and cattle and horses and different kinds of crops. And then they also are exposed to more traditional activities such as education, mental health counseling, substance abuse treatment, and those kinds of things. And the neat thing about the Environmental Institute uh, way of, of handling the development of the youth is that they're required to progress through four different phases to eventually obtain release from the Environmental Institute. So we don't have a lot of evaluations uh, about the program and how successful it is on a long-term basis. Not a lot of longitudinal studies to say that, you know, Johnny is still being compliant with the law two years, four years, six years down the road. But um, the statistics that the founders uh, generate uh, tend to indicate that the work ethic that they build in the character among the youth work. So our wilderness camps effective at reducing recidivism among delinquent youth, we really don't know. Uh, studies suggest that the core foundation of a wilderness camp is not sufficient enough impact uh, to the youth to reduce recidivism rates. Uh, Sandra Joe Wilson and Mark Lipsy in 2000 did a study of wilderness-based camps, and uh, they were focused, uh, they found that the camps were focused basically on phil physically challenging situations, didn't really address uh, or become effective in reducing recidivism. Um, but the reason that they found that the wilderness camps overall did not show effectiveness was because overall they did not have treatment services added to them. So then the flip side of the coin is, okay, we add treatment services, family, individual group therapy services in there, a little bit more of a wraparound concept, and all of a sudden, boom, we have something that's, you know, uh, more effective. Uh, studies on boot camps, for example, showed they didn't have any effect in reducing recidivism either unless there was a treatment component that was added. So, you know, then, then you, you dissect a little bit. You say, okay, well, what was effective? It was it the wilderness program, was it the treatment, or was it the combination of wilderness and treatment? And the interesting thing uh, Mackenzie Glover, Stive, and Mitchell found in 2000 
was that the treatment services were the reason for the reduction of recidivism, not the structure of the boot camps or wilderness camps that they that the kids attended. So again, we go back to what we're trying to do with peacekeeper justice and emphasizing the decriminalization of the American population uh, and the deinstitutionalization of the American population in favor of uh, psychosocial educational programs, you know, training them how to be better people because we've lost that with the broken families across this country, uh, with the educational system in tatters, uh, with the lack of investment that we have made in our youth and in the maintain, maintenance of the family in this country, uh, we have a need somewhere to help to expose people to something which is positive and pro-social and to educate them on how to be good citizens. You know, we don't have civics classes anymore in our the majority of our high schools. So somewhere, somebody has to expose these people to wanting to be part of a bigger picture. Or they wind up here in the residential treatment center, okay? And that's why residential treatment centers have increased in popularity in the last 20 to 30 years. Because as a society, we are investing less and less and less in our future, and we are investing more and more in what we want right now. And as a result of that lack of investment in our long-term potential, uh, we're the same thing as a huge corporation that doesn't do any research and development, doesn't do any product improvement. Eventually, nobody wants your product. And so in this country, uh, our kids don't want the product we're generating as a society. They're going off on their own. They're getting into trouble, criminogenic behavior. So numerous residential treatment centers are serving juvenile populations. Uh, Susan Hockenberry and her colleagues in 2011 found that residential treatment centers made up about a third of all the facilities out there, and they held roughly 36% of all juvenile offenders. So when we look at the most basic level, uh, these centers provide treatment services to juveniles in a residential environment. You know, the youth may attend school during the day, group-based treatment such as anger management or substance abuse counseling in the evenings or weekends. The focus of the facility is treatment rather than punishment. That's why it's called a residential treatment center. The centers are intended to serve youth who present with significant issues. They may be behavioral or emotional issues, but they are not deemed to be so severe that they need to be placed in a long-term correctional facility. In theory, these residential treatment centers are designed to be short-term centers for treatment and stabilization. So like all the facilities and programs that we've discussed so far, the juveniles served at the residential treatment centers vary quite a bit as well. They tend to have severe emotional and behavioral issues. They suffer complex histories of trauma and abuse. They tend to have significant issues with their family, with school and peers that they've been involved in. About half of the youth attending residential treatment centers um, didn't live with their parents prior to their admission into the facility. They were getting into trouble being on their own or being with peers. So at the same time, painting these centers on the youth that they serve with a broad treatment brush is kind of difficult. Um, some residential treatment centers primarily admit high-need youth. Others may serve youth from less severe backgrounds. There's two critical issues that emerge with regard to residential treatment centers. First, there's concerns that the facilities could be mixing high-risk youth with those who are lower risk, and then the lower risk youth, you know, go to crime school with the high-risk youth, and we're actually making a bad situation worse. So the second option is whether these centers are sufficiently intensive. Uh, they're called residential treatment centers, so the mindset of the administrators and staff are going to be treatment-focused, right? Well, are they intensive enough in their treatment approach? Um, there may be youth there with significant behavioral problems, histories that involve trauma and abuse. Is the treatment sufficiently intensive enough to address the needs of the youth? Um, some studies suggest the treatment should be between three months and 12 months long. The length of the stay at these facilities is usually pretty short, 90 days or less. So it doesn't appear to very much, uh, it doesn't appear to vary very much based on the needs of the youth and maybe too short to actually do the youth any long-term good. 
So the controversy surrounding residential treatment centers is simply similar to the same controversy that surrounds the long-term secure correctional institutions. And we're going to take a look at that now. So long-term secure correctional facilities. This is where, this, these are the YDCs. This, these are the, this is the hardcore stuff. And long-term secure correctional facilities are the closest parallel that we have to our adult prisons around the country. Different states call them different things. North Carolina refers to these as YDCs. They have six YDCs across the state. Ohio refers to these as juvenile correctional facilities. They have four of them across the state. California has three facilities. They call them youth correctional facilities. Rhode Island has one. They call it a training school. So. Um, what are some of the characteristics of these? Well, we're looking at roughly 17,270, 300 youth committed to long-term secure facilities as of 2010. Size of the facilities varies a lot. 25% of them house youth between, uh, house between 21 and 50 youth, 27% hold between 51 and 100, 24, only a quarter of them, 24% hold between 101 and 200 youth. Um, the demographic profiles uh, we're looking basically as 91% males, 42% African American. Uh, what are some of the uh, things that they were supposed to have done? Well, the, the top offenses were robbery in order, robbery, burglary, aggravated assault, and sexual assault. So these these are the these are the bad kids that get put into these long term secure facilities around the country, and there aren't that many of them. But where there are, they basically parallel adult facilities. So does putting them into these facilities actually work? You know, the punitive strategies for juveniles became popular during when? 80s and 90s, right? Get tough on crime. So the phenomena was seen in the rate of prison placements for youth. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be saying prison, I should be saying out of home placements. The out of home placements for youth. So OJJDP found that placements in residential facilities increased about 40% during the 90s alone. And a lot of this was based on the street level gang, drug sales kind of culture that we had during that time period, the visibility of that, the number of crimes that were being committed, and the, um, the feeling society had about the need to incarcerate youth in order to be able to get some kind of a handle on this runaway crime wave. So we're seeing a reduction now in the number of juveniles placed in long-term facilities these days. Um, the number of juveniles in custody has actually declined 12% since 2006. And this decline in the number of juveniles is partly reflective of the reduction in the arrests for juvenile delinquency. Um, but there's also two big aspects that are contributing to this. And that's cost and effectiveness. We're looking across the country at how much these suckers are costing us, and we're wondering, okay, is it doing any good? And I think I think those of you who have been with me in a couple of these seminars remember remember the example I was giving you about the boot camps that I I spoke with boot camp juveniles uh, who were bragging to me that they committed the crimes that they did because they knew they were going to get sentenced to a boot camp as a result because that's what the state's policy was, and they wanted to go through the boot camp. Because when they graduated from the boot camp, they would then have their quote-unquote chain gang time. And when they went back to their uh, street drug gang, they would then get promoted within the gang because they had their chain gang time and, uh, you know, grow to lieutenant or, or what have you. And it, it was really interesting to talk with some of these juveniles about the pride that they had in coming into uh, the state correctional system. Uh, going through the boot camp as though it were their own street gang, you know, military academy, and then getting their commission, as it were, uh, within the street drug gang when they returned because they had had the experience. So they wanted to do the best that they could at the boot camp. They wanted to establish a good rep while they were in the boot camp for being hardcore uh, and being able to survive it as well as they possibly could so that that was something that gave them bragging rights when they went back to the street. You know, another another example of us trying to do the right thing. Uh, institutionalizing these folks is not a cost-effective sanction. The American Correctional Association estimates that it costs about $88,000 to house a juvenile in a high-security institution. Now, obviously, this differs a lot based on 
uh, one state to the next. Um, Edward Latessa from the University of Cincinnati, outstanding college when it comes to statistical analysis and research in criminal justice, found that the average costs of community-based programs were estimated to be somewhere around 9,000 a year uh, for a community for that community-based program as compared to about 57,000 if you looked at the secure facilities in Ohio. So the high cost of incarcerating these young people makes sense if one considers the staffing costs, the amount of money that you need to run the institution with the utilities and the cost to maintain the services like the medical and the mental health and such. Um, a study of California's cost of incarcerating mentally ill juveniles uh, revealed about 12.5% of the youth in detention received some form of psychotropic meds. Um, the psychotropic meds ran an average cost per year um, of around, for Los Angeles, $1.9 million, so almost $2 million a year for psychotropic meds and psychiatric uh, uh, assessments for Los Angeles alone. The other 14 counties who got involved in a survey reported a combined total of around $600,000, averaging about $43,000 per county. So the cost of incarcerating a juvenile with a mental illness is even more, probably adds about $19,000 or so to the total tab that you have when it comes to incarceration. So how do we justify incarceration? or out of home placement. Well, we justified on the grounds of public safety, right? If Johnny's a real bad kid uh, between the ages of 16 and 17 years old and commits a lot of crimes, well then maybe just, you know, incarcerating him is the best way to handle things. So the effectiveness of confining these people is something that we're constantly discussing and we're assessing and trying to figure out what we're going to do. And we kind of get painted into a corner on the whole deal. If we take a step back and we look at this from a philosophical perspective, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are we doing it for? What's the use of doing this? It's been argued there's four primary goals of confining these, these kids. There's retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, and incapacitation. So let's take a look at what we're talking about here. When it comes to um, retribution, retribution rests with the whole idea of revenge, doesn't it? the harm that this kid has done on society, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, we're going we're gonna to lock him up. So the one thing that retributive policies are supposed to do is to punish. The justification for the punishment isn't about why the youth committed the crime or what social circumstances should be changed in their lives. All we really care about is punishment for their transgressions for what they did. Retribution as a goal of incarceration isn't necessarily related to effectiveness because punishment is just punishment. It's not meant to change behavior for the future. I mean, there's no, there's no treatment. There's no therapy. There's no trying to get Jenny to understand that A plus B equals C. There's just punishment. So um, if, you know, most people if asked would argue that they would hope that the punishment would produce a long-term change, but the idea that punishment should produce future changes in the youth uh, is a foundation for deterrence theory that we just kind of hope uh, works. Now, when taking a look at the deterrence theory, um, it asserts that punishment should reduce the future likelihood of a crime. Uh, first, the punishment sends a message to the juveniles that certain behavior isn't acceptable. The sanction is going to occur if they conduct themselves in a particular way. This sanction of deterrence then should teach youth that there are consequences for what they do. And then this consequence should reduce future criminal behavior. The phenomenon is referred to as specific deterrence. Um, Related, the punishment may have a wider effect on behavior, in particular on others who see that the youth was punished. The friends that they have, their peer group, see what happens to Johnny and they go, oh, I don't want to go there. Um, you might hear judges or politicians or prosecutors say, well, we want to send a message you know, to the community that we're not going to take this anymore. And so that's that, that's that deterrence aspect of things. Um, that general deterrence to the community has become increasingly popular. Uh, during the Get Tough period, the philosophy of deterrence really took off through our political circles around this country. And a lot of this was 
evidence through the transfer of juveniles into the adult system and adult prisons and increasing the use of confinement of juvenile institutions overall. When we talk about incapacitation as a third goal, that fits within the confinement of juveniles, right? Incapacitation rests with the idea that a person can't commit a crime if they're confined. Now, that's not exactly accurate because juveniles commit crimes even within the institutions. So, yeah, they do still commit crimes, but it does minimize crime within the community because instead of committing the crime in the community, they're committing crime within the institution. So it could be argued that incarcerating juveniles during the years in which they're at higher risk for committing crime, that 16 to 18 year time frame would reduce the crime rate because they're the ones who are committing the majority of the crime. And then finally, the fourth goal that we talked about was rehabilitation and is the goal of, of confinement to punish to deter, to incarcerate, or to rehabilitate, which one of those is. If it's simply to just punish for the sake of revenge, for the wrongdoing, um, then it could be argued that confinement serves that purpose. If the purpose is to incarcerate, to reduce crime in the community, then one could argue that if the juvenile is incarcerated, that goal is likely rise. However, if the goal is either to deter or to rehabilitate, that effectiveness is much more difficult to assess. And that's the one that gives us the biggest problems because we're trying to figure out um, how to get these things done as cost effectively as we can, but with as much fairness to the juvenile as we possibly can. So regarding deterrence, there have been a lot of studies on the deterrent effect of punitive policies. Studies might show that mandatory sentences for drug offenders haven't reduced the crime rate significantly, but they have significantly increased our prison population and the costs that are associated with that. Policies designed to eliminate discretion in the criminal justice system don't allow courtroom work groups, the prosecutors and judges and clerks and all that, to consider the nuances of each individual case. Uh, other studies uh, suggest harsh conditions don't serve as a deterrence to crime. Uh, Useem and Kimball back in 87 explored prison riots, and they concluded that when the administration eliminated amenities like programming and TV and things like that, their prisoners actually became more violent. We saw this when I was working within the prison system um, with the removal of weights, that we waited and waited to try to have the weights not removed from the inmates because the more that they exercised, um, the healthier that they were, the better they acted. But once inmates began using the weights to attack other people and the weights were removed, they didn't have a way to work out a lot of those frustrations uh, that they needed to. They didn't have a way to reduce stress. And when you have 1,200 men locked in an area, uh, you can have, uh, in, you know, as a, its own deviant community, uh, you can have a lot of stress and anxiety that needs to be taken care of. And there's not a real easy way to do that. So if the goal is to have equality and punishment, one could argue that by making prisons more depriving, it increases the pains of imprisonment actually more for some than others. And what that does is that reduces equality within the prison and that just makes things worse. With regard to rehabilitation, some studies suggest that if a prison culture is one that supports treatment services, it can actually be more effective. For example, we have institutions that provide educational services for youth where they attend school for a large part of the day. Uh, many institutions offer group-based treatment services that are targeted to specific uh, problems, such as substance addiction or life skills or anger management or victim awareness or something. Others provide vocational opportunities where they work on computers or they do woodworking or they learn agricultural things, maybe auto repair. So a lot of youth don't leave these facility, uh, facilities fully equipped for careers necessarily, but the exposure to these different areas may prompt them to think in pro-social ways about them and maybe pursue them once they get out. Um, it's through these exposures in, within treatment-oriented facilities that the youth have better attitudes toward being institutionalized or what happened to them in the institution. The reality is that long-term secure institutions often have to prioritize custody and security over rehab. And if you take a look at a lot of the complaints about private uh, prisons, privatized prisons, uh, privatized detention centers, and so forth, a lot of the complaints come from um, violence which has occurred 
within the facilities. Now, it's very difficult for a reasonable human being to believe that violence will not exist within a prison. And, you know, a lot of people think that correctional officers are wandering around within prisons and all the inmates are locked up all the time. And the correctional officers all carry Glocks and uh, they all have OC spray and they all have batons and they all just, you know, walk around. And if there's an inmate doing something they don't like, then they just rush in and just beat him down. And, and they have this, you know, idea, this concept about prisons as being these places where correctional staff can just run amok, basically treating um, the inmates in any way that they want to. And they say, oh, this is the most terrible thing that could exist. Well, I'm here to tell you from personal experience within the prison system as one of those COs many years ago, and then later as a trainer for the state, that uh, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the inmates typically, especially in what's called, see, there's two different forms of supervision. There's direct and indirect supervision. Usually in these juvenile cases, it's all direct supervision, which means that the correctional officers are mixed right in there with the youth. Now, what do the correctional officers have for weapons? Do they have a baton? No. Do they have a gun? No. A lot of places, the reason they don't have a baton is because if 10 inmates rush you and take your baton away from you, they could just beat you senseless with a baton. So it's not a good idea to have a baton. Um, uh, do they have OC spray? Typically, no. Most of the time, the only people within a correctional facility who would have any kind of oleorespiratory capsicum spray uh, would be the correctional emergency response team or tactical squads that might be inherent within that organization. And typically, you don't find CERT teams or tax squads in juvenile facilities. So what do they have? Uh, they have their good looks and their ability to communicate effectively, and they probably have a radio that they can use to call for help. So that's about it, you know, and that's within both our adult prisons as well as within our juvenile facilities. So the next time that you see somebody in the grocery store and they have a patch on and they're in uniform and it says that they're from so-and-so prison or so-and-so correctional institution, uh, you don't need to be afraid that that individual is just going to walk over and do something mean to you uh, for no apparent reason, because these people will walk into a dormitory facility in a prison that has 50 or 100 or more inmates wandering all over the place and just stand there in the midst of all of these convicted criminals and and work and supervise them and get them to do what they need for them to do. And that's their job. And it is amazing that we have people who want to subject themselves to that kind of environment just amazing. And so you should respect these individuals who are able to uh, deal with being in an environment where they're locked down exactly like the inmates are and uh, can still survive and still be pro-social and positive examples of who you're supposed to be. I'm not going to say that 100% of them act the way that they're supposed to 100% of the time. That would be an impossibility with all of us being human beings. But if you take a look at the deaths and incidents across this entire country compared to the number of people who were institutionalized uh, and the number of days they spend in the system, you'll find that it's a minuscule fraction of um, uh, problems we have with any kind of violence within the correctional system. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which goes an additional step further to monitoring correctional personnel, whether it be adult or juveniles, uh, that they're working with uh, in ensuring that the inmates aren't taking advantage of each other and the staff are only acting appropriately.